substantial part of the population thinks that uh, there's a secret effort by Muslims to take over the country and impose Sharia law. And a fair number think that Obama's an advance agent for it. I mean, you know, this and the same similar things are going on in Europe. In fact, even in Australia, I don't know how many Muslims there are there, but the same thing's going on there. Uh, and uh, it's it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's uh, in the United States. Let's just in, in Europe. And my feeling is that I've always felt that Europe is more racist than the United States. It didn't show up as much because the societies are more homogeneous, you know. So maybe it wasn't so obvious, but I think it's very profound. So, for example, in the United States, one of the few countries where citizenship comes with birth. If you're born here, you're a citizen, 14th Amendment. In Germany, if you want to become a citizen, you have to prove authentic German roots, you know, whatever that's supposed to mean. Uh, it's and the same throughout Europe. And now that there's now Europe is kind of stuck. They need immigrant workers, but they don't want them to be there because it interferes with the homogeneity and you know they're not bl blonde, blonde and blue eyed, you know, and they don't behave like we do and so on. So there's, a, there's plenty of evidence in the United States. It's uh, First of all, the United States the United States is an immigrant society. Everybody's an immigrant. But, and until about the mid-19th century, there were no restrictions on immigrants because they were coming from Europe, you know, the good guys. And by the latter part of the 19th century, restrictions were being introduced. So, for example, the Irish were considered like blacks. You walk around Boston, see signs saying, no dogs are Irish. Uh, but you know they were kind of let in. They were, Orientals were just excluded. Uh, the uh, uh, I mean this goes on almost to the present. Uh, there were harsh immigration laws in the 1920. I mean the basic idea is look we've got what we want. We don't want anyone else to disturb it. On the other hand, it's like Europe. We need them. Uh, nobody's going to clean clean the houses and work in the restaurants and do the construction work and pick the tomatoes and so on unless they're here, but we don't want them. Uh, and they're going to take over our country. They're destroying it. And this is uh, exacerbated by the economic crisis. I mean, constantly here, uh, look, I'm a construction worker and I can't get a job because some Mexican is willing to work for two cents, you know, illegal, you know. And uh, you can, these are all understand. I mean, the sensible reaction would be to say, okay, unionize them and raise the wages. But that's not the reaction, or do something to, to, so that Mexicans don't have to flee here. We're responsible for that, after all, in large measure. Uh, but those are not the answers that are given. The answers that are given are racist. It, and with uh, it, um, uh, Muslims, it's of course connected with long-standing uh, anti-Muslim attitudes that go back centuries. I mean, they're now being intensified because of. Uh, the conflicts in the Middle East because of the recession and also because of something very significant that's happening in the United States. Uh, whites are becoming a minority and that's causing a lot of fear and anger. It's our country. I mean, forget the fact that we exterminated the indigenous population and took it. It's our country, or take say Mexico. I mean the Southwest and the Far West were stolen from Mexico. And that's why you have cities with names like uh, San Francisco and San Diego, Spanish names. Uh, but so we stole it fair and square. Uh, now it's ours, and they're not allowed to come here after we've uh, ruined their country. Uh, all of this is tied together, and you can you, I, you can sympathize with the people. I mean, they don't want to be a minority in what they think of as their country. They don't want their job taken away by a Mexican who the employer is willing to employed, you know, illegally. Uh, and so the feelings are really there and they're coming out in very ugly ways. And the Islamophobia is just one part of it. Uh, you saw it in the uh, debate about this uh, so-called mosque, the Islamic Center. Uh, practically nobody pointed out that if that's holy ground, uh, how come between the Islamic projected Islamic Center and uh, ground zero there are 
you know, a shop selling pornography and strip joints and so on and so forth. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's ugly. Yeah. Actually, I think the point was made pretty well by George Orwell. Uh, yeah, everyone has read Animal Farm, you know, satire of the totalitarian enemy. Almost nobody's read the introduction to Animal Farm. The one reason is it wasn't published. It was found in his unpublished papers, you know, 30 years later. He intended an introduction. It's quite interesting. The introduction is aimed at the people of England. Animal Farm was published in England. He says, yeah, of course, this is a satirical uh, critique of the monstrous enemy, but people of England shouldn't feel too self-satisfied. And now I'm essentially quoting, because in free England, ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. And he goes on to talk about it. He says two reasons, basically. One is the press is owned by wealthy men who have every interest in not wanting certain ideas to be expressed. The other, and I think that gets to the heart of it, is a good education. If you went to Oxford and Cambridge and the best schools and the part of polite, educated society, you have it instilled in you, internalized, that there are certain things it wouldn't do to say. And I think we can go on. It wouldn't even do to think them. So one effect of... Uh, immersion in a educated society is the things you can't think.